You know, I, I wonder sometimes uh, what I am doing up here teaching. I have to admit, when it comes to, to politics, sports, guns, and sewing, I'm at a loss. You know, when, when, when people talk about these things, I, I try to use the standard proverb. A person may, may be thought of as a fool until he opens his mouth and removes all doubt. <laughs> so if I'm in a group of guys talking about sports and, and uh, you know, them reciting names of football players and, the, and the, the giftedness and all their energy and their skills, like everyone's business, you know, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just nod my head and just keep my mouth shut. Uh, you know, if I do mo open my mouth, I'll just parrot what they've said. Oh, yeah, he's awesome, you know, or whatever, not knowing what I'm saying, but I'll, you know, just at least to feel like I'm one of the guys, you know. Um, because, you know, the experts, they know what's true, right? You just go with the experts. The same goes when I'm around sewers, quilters, and, and uh, knitters. You know, I don't know why I said that, but I just want to get you guys all to feel a little bit lost. Uh, yeah. This is just to show how lost I feel sometimes in the conversations I'm in. Just the other day, I was at the Scoovels, and, and Fred was showing me his, uh, his gun that he had with a, on the force. And rather than let him, me tell him what it was, as I was handling this, I says, oh, uh, this must be a 9 millimeter. <laughs> it was a 45. Um, <laughs> you know, I might be able to tell the difference now, but I should have kept my mouth shut and let him tell me, you know, and instead of have him remove all doubt, yeah, this guy really knows a lot about guns. Um, what is true wisdom? Is it following and believing everything the experts say? Is it, is it being able to reason out moral logic to conform truth to the way we live, think, and feel? Is it the process by which we can build up our self-esteem using comparisons of, of talents, associations, and accomplishments to verify our importance. None of you are nodding your heads and agreeing with me. <laughs> you're, not, you're, not, you're not doing the, perver the, the proverb, you know, just nod your head. No, uh, you're not taking my advice that I give myself. But you all have an inside scoop of what true wisdom is. And these questions are a little bit off track regarding true wisdom. Do any of you know what a back tack is? Come on, sewers. Jack, you know a back tack. That was, I Googled up sewing terms just, to, just so I could, you know, get some, get, so I can spooze you guys and say, man, this guy knows about sewing. Um, it was one of the first terms listed. I already forgot what it meant, but, uh, <laughs> but I know that a back tack is a sewing term. The last term listed was zipper, okay? I know what a zipper is. You know, that would be me in a conversation with terms like weft, tool, sloper, scallops. You know, I like the word scallops, you know, and I, and I, but I know better that in the context of sewing, it's not, I'm, I'm not going to go and say, oh, yeah, I like my scallops with garlic butter drizzled all over the top. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the scallops we're talking about when we're talking about sewing. Um, instead, a wise person would capitalize on what he knows about sewing, you know. So a zipper, you just take that thingamajig and you just zip it up, right? You know, by the way, X, Y, Z. <laughs> oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> I would be better to take the proverb to zip to the zipper term and zip my mouth shut. You know, I don't know what the terms of all that sewing stuff are. There's a reason I don't teach sewing classes. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, 
For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And then let's turn to Proverbs 14, 12. You know, I can do that. I can focus on the simplest term in the Bible that Paul keeps going to and saying, I reserve to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The simplest and most exciting message of this world has ever known shows the incredible wisdom of God to us. You know, this is what Paul was trying to get across and, and get these Corinthians to understand. You know, we talked last week how God has made the gospel simple. The first teaching of the Proverbs we read this morning is that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. It doesn't say they can't grasp it. Fools can't grasp wisdom. They don't want wisdom. You know, my natural tendency is to despise wisdom and discipline. You know, we, we go for the wisdom of the world. We, we, we tend to compare ourselves with those around us. We, we tend to formulate our ideas and, and correctness to what we understand as our best interests. But our tactics are foolish. In Proverbs 14, 12, it says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And if you'll turn to Proverbs 14, I mean 16, 25, just, to, just up a couple past, uh, chapters, it reads, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Let's, let's turn back to Proverbs 3, 5. You know, God calls us to compare ourselves to Him. And when you compare a simple marble to the most sophisticated computer out there, that marble shouldn't have room to boast, especially if that sophisticated computer was part of what created that marble in the first place. Are you following me? This is where wisdom begins. Wisdom isn't comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges, or people to people. It, it, it begins with a comparison of this piece of flesh to the God of this vast universe, to the God who created us with our minds and our, and our physique and, and all the things around us, the, the multitude of fruit trees, the multitude of plants, the multitude of species. I mean, and, and, and we go, whoa! Whoa! Who, who am I that God is mindful of me? It begins with comparing this flesh, piece of flesh that doesn't know the slightest about sewing to the one who knit me together in my mother's womb. True wisdom puts to death our way of understanding things and justifying our motives to then rise to acknowledge God's way. In Proverbs 3, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Please, let's turn to 1 Peter 2, 21. You know, if we start... This humbling comparison. We should start it with the cross. You know, God in His most vulnerable state showed that our best interests are found in self-sacrifice, not self-advancement. Jesus' path went to the most humbling and shameful circumstances in His life down here. I mean, He, he started in, in a feeding trough, in a stable. And then he moved, you know, he's talking and he's ministering to people, but he, he says, follow me. Uh, birds have 
nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. And then he went on to the most shameful place this world has ever known. And, and the most, oh, what do you say, it? the most torturous device man has ever known, a cross. To hang naked before his torturers, to hang naked before his friends, and to be in agony, and then to hold his tongue. The world would call Jesus' submission to the cross dumb or a foolish move. It is the wisdom of God. Jesus could have opened his mouth and put all the mockers, all the judges to shame. He could have opened his mouth and obliterated this world. But instead, he took the dumbness of his sheep, as it says in Isaiah 53, 7. In 1 Peter 2, verse 21, it says, To this you were called. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered you, leaving you an example to follow, that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, <clears throat> he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. And instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins on, in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Well, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. This is countercultural stuff. This isn't, this isn't demanding our rights kind of stuff and saying that we want rights. We want to live this way. We want to live with our best interests at heart. This is sacrifice. And Jesus says, follow me. Be, follow my example. And Peter says, follow his in his steps. It goes against my grain. You know, I, I might hold my tongue when it comes to sowing, but when somebody is starting to tear me down unjustly, I tell you what, I open my mouth and I try to remove all doubt. That's when all the real wisdom is revealed. You know, notice I didn't say true wisdom. Jesus told us to deny ourselves. And take up our cross daily and follow him in Luke 9.23. Wisdom doesn't begin with the fear of man and what man can do. It begins with the fear of God and what he can do. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told to bow down to that image while there was a furnace burning and ready for them to get thrown into if they didn't, they feared God more than they did that furnace in Daniel 3. When David went against Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, and he saw this giant who, who put Israel, the armies of Israel, shaking in their boots, David says, I fear God more than this giant. And this giant is going to learn how, what fear of God means. As he went to him and his giant was mocking him as he's just carrying a little sling and a couple of stones. And David, whoo, giant couldn't think twice. Before he knew it, he was unconscious and his head was cut off. When Abraham went up to sacrifice his son in Genesis 22, he feared God more than what he feared his wife would think or his workers would think, even in, in his own self. I mean, this was his son, and he showed God that he feared God more than he feared man. It mattered what God thought of him. God's wisdom is foolishness to this world. 
The 13 verses that we're about to read from 1 Corinthians 1 has wisdom and its related words written at least 21 times. And I, and I think foolishness is related to wisdom. I know it's the opposite, but 21 times. And first, starting with verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is man? Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. And uh, while, while we're here looking at, at Greeks, you know, we think of the Greek wisdom. They were pretty smart guys. And, and Socrates was one of the, the Greek philosophers. And, and he said, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. And he's fairly close, all right? But he was ignorant of the fear of God and the foolishness of Christ crucified. In verse 23, if we go on, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Now, this is the nuts and bolts of Christianity. You know, not a discussion of who we follow, what specific belief system we adhere to, or how we go about our worship. You know, I could rattle off some religious terms like absolutism, advent, agape, angelology, uh, antinomianism. You know, anti anybody know what antinon? Well, I probably ain't saying it right anyways. But uh, anti, I didn't know this term. Antinomianism. Okay, there you go. This is, this one term was a, a new term to me. It is the belief that a saved believer can freely sin because he is forgiven of past and future transgressions. That's what antinomianism Yeah. Okay. And I started going down pages and pages of these, these terms. I mean, I got to know what I'm saying up here, right? So anyways, of religious terms, and there were quite a few I didn't know. And I didn't even get out of the A's, okay? I didn't go all the way to Z like I did with the sewing terms. I, I, I stayed in the A's, and, and one of the last A's was autosoterism. It's the belief that a person is responsible for their own salvation, which is attained through their good works. You know, I don't have to know all the religious terms in order to preach Christ and Him crucified and the wisdom of God. I don't need to know the game name of a gun in order to shoot it, right? I don't have to be comfortable in a dialogue with scholars or religious people to have the wisdom of God. And I don't have to go to a famous seminary with a lot of degrees behind my name be, to have the wisdom of God and to share it with you. And you don't either. You know, I love it when our, our men's group get together for breakfast. And we're just all sitting at the table. And, and I believe everyone feels on level with expressing their ideas about a passage that we just read out of Psalms. You know, the food is good, but the Psalms are great. There's a, there's a spiritual and a special camaraderie of insights and, and a camaraderie of our ignorance. I don't think anyone feels ashamed as we share because someone didn't know what autosoterism means. You know, there is that shared awe of hearing new things, yet very familiar things with the constant backdrop of the cross. You know, God's wisdom is found in dumbness. 
I'm dumbfounded when I get to reading God's Word with eyes that want to see new things. Not there to prove what I already know or what wisdom I have inside of me, but something new, something God is saying, okay, get this. And I'm blown away. And it's awesome. I, I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting there writing a sermon and I already know what I'm going to say. And God says, no, you're not. You got something else to say. And I'm saying, whoa, this is so much better. I encounter his word and I feel like a child that is just learning what one plus one is. Whoa, two. The Corinthian church was beginning to limit their wisdom by identifying with Apollos, Peter, Paul, or even the term of baptism rather than move beyond to where there no one has gone before. This is the journey in awe of God. That never ends. It, it never ends. I, I believe when we go to heaven, you know, eternity is going to be low. Look what God, God's going to be like. Show and tell, okay? This is what I have for you today, kids. Woohoo! This is awesome. All day, every day, forever and ever and ever. And we're just going to be going, whoa, holy, holy. That's a, I wonder why the angels in heaven, the only thing they have to say is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. is a, because They're just, whoa, they're in his presence. And it's incredible. And, 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 and he brings that to us when we read his word. We're just great. This is the journey of awe that never ends. It's a newness and freshness that silences my understanding to a renewed trust in the Lord. We read on in, in verse 26 of Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. You know, Wiersbe said, before conversion, Paul had a very self-righteous, was very, had been very self-righteous. He had to give up his religion in order to go to heaven. The Corinthians were at the other end of the spectrum, and yet they too were not too sinful for God to reach and save them. The message and miracle of God's grace in Jesus Christ utterly confounds, puts to shame, the high and mighty people of this world. You know, Paul at one time thought he had attained religious perfection. And, and as he's going and, and traveling to Damascus and, and trying to drag those prisoners back to Jerusalem because they didn't believe the way he believed because his way was right, he had the wisdom. God, Jesus, knocked him off his high horse and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard to kick against the goads, the pricks, or whatever. Paul, you're, you're, you're just pushing everything away from you. All this wisdom that I want to give you. Because you're just so ingrained in your own wisdom. And everything you see has to do with what you already know. Instead of what I want to show you. Here I am. Right now, I'm going to blind you with my light. And in order for Paul to see, he had to be blinded. And sometimes that's the way we are. In order for us to become wise, we have to become fools. To understand what God is saying. We don't know nothing. Paul had to...
had to become a fool to gain wisdom. You know, there's so many religions out there that will agree with the wisdom quote of Socrates. You know, in order to be wise, you have to admit that you know nothing or whatever he said. The Buddhisms, they, they try to reach nirvana by emptying their minds and, and, and going into that. The Indians or uh, Hindus, Hindus, they, they go into this transcendental state of meditation and the, the whole focus is on nothing. Don't focus on anything. Everything you, all your thoughts, everything just disappears. And there's a certain amount of wisdom in that because that's what God says to us. We need to empty ourselves. But He doesn't stop there. He doesn't want us to be blank blackboards with nothing written on them. He wants to fill us with His wisdom, which is far greater than anything we could have ever erased, anything good that we could have ever erased in our minds and in our thoughts. That's the message of the cross. That's the wisdom, true wisdom. We can replace foolishness with the message of the cross as the tree becomes for us a tree of life. Replacing the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now may we all encourage and be encouraged by this wonderful foolishness. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today. And I ask you to empty our minds, empty our lives, and clean us up, Lord, from what is foolish and wrong with our lives. So that as we release those things that, that make us feel important, that make us feel wise, Lord, we can then be allowed to see how foolish we were and to grasp little bits of how wise you are, how strong you are. Lord, in our weaknesses, let us show your strength. And Lord, as we go about in this world, Lord, help us to share the message of the cross, the message of foolishness with those around us. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.